So let me introduce our third speaker, Dr. Adnan Rafiq, who is the Program Director for Pakistan for the United States Institute of Peace. Adnan is a senior development practitioner with a focus on public policy design analysis and implementation. He has a DPhil from the University of Oxford in politics, and he works on the political economy, governance, security, peace building, international relations, and strategic affairs. Adnan has advised the Minister of, of, for Interior in Pakistan from 2017 to 2018, and he has coordinated and authored the National Internal Security Policy Report 2018 for the Government of Pakistan as the team lead. He has multiple years of experience leading research and development initiatives for a range of organizations, including the UNDP, the DAI, the UN Women, and the British Council. He's also an established author. He co-edited a book titled Pakistan's Democratic Transition, Change and Persistence, published by Routledge in 2016. He has also published a journal paper in telecommunications policy, and he contributes frequently opinion pieces for national and international newspapers, such as Dawn, The News Express, Express Tribune, Tribune, Daily Times, and The Huffington Post. Adnan, over to you. Thank you so much, Nosheen, and uh, thanks so much for the opportunity as well. Um, <clears throat> I would like to keep my remarks at, at sort of a macro level, looking at the, uh, the intersection between securitization and some of these emerging challenges, including climate change and um, COVID-19. And I would draw uh, uh, a little bit from a research that was conducted uh, during the last two years on the USIP's uh, platform uh, led by Dr. Adil Najam. And we have some of the preliminary findings from it that I would like to share. But uh, generally, we have been looking at, you know, how national security policy has, um, has, has evolved or is sort of, you know, uh, uh, evolving uh, given the expanded nature of uh, uh, spectrum of various uh, emerging threats. Um, as we all know, Pakistan has a long history of uh, securitization in various fields, in various shapes and forms. It has been dubbed in the literature as a security state at times or as a garrison state. And since the inception of the country, a number of a host of security challenges have um, you know, led to a disproportionately large security operators that has uh, since held uh, overwhelming sway over um, national policies. Um, and, and, and most of, uh, most of that has been countering uh, perceived security threat from India and more so along the traditional lines. Uh, during the last 20 years, uh, that scenario changed when the extremism and terrorism sort of became some of the key uh, security threats to the country. Um, extremism was dubbed as an existential uh, since the APS attack. And so we had added to the mix these, um, what are still actually considered slightly non-traditional security threats um, to, to, to the broader spectrum. And uh, in the last 20 years, and particularly in the last seven years, a lot of have, efforts have gone into uh, dealing with extremism, terrorism, and, uh, and the violence that's related to these phenomena uh, than, than the traditional security threat or other emerging uh, aspects. Uh, over the last uh, few years, there have always been a case has always been has also been made to point towards climate change, and you know now with COVID nineteen, the health pandemic as well in terms of its implications for uh, national security, and uh, we see that you know we we can look at it uh, in two ways. One, we have to look at the intrastate dynamics see how various arms of the state look at these dynamics and, and what, do, what do they mean for it. And secondly, we have to look at it from a state and society uh, perspective and see how uh, this might be affecting various segments of the society and what sort of policy pressures it, it might be building for the decision makers. 
so the in terms of the intrastate dynamics of course uh, you know as i mentioned um, there has been a disproportionate um, or a power asymmetry where the security operators has held greater influence on on public policy as a whole and that means that you know everything ranging from economic policy to uh, development and to health and education etc or what we normally club as a welfare regime uh, for the people has been subservient to the national strategic interests or the national security interests so to speak and there has been much less emphasis on the welfare side of things which include many of the dimensions uh, along you know issues like health education environment welfare so on and so forth and therefore if one has to uh, include um, environment or health as key uh, national security issues then it 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 poses a dilemma for the traditional thinking or traditional structures of the state in terms of either considering them as a security threat and and leading to a greater securitization of these issues where uh, institutions like ndma for example take a greater role in terms of dealing with them we've already seen that establishment of the ncoc or the covid-19 response in pakistan has been coordinated largely by the ndma and other uh, related uh, you know uh, military institutions as well have been heavily involved in it or you know uh, or whether inclusion of these issues in the national security domain can lead to more of a more of a welfareization of of the national security where you know uh, again it it is unclear but where the health experts or environmentalists and these people take a lead in terms of developing state policy and these uh, both scenarios have implications for how resources are distributed and you know how how they affect the power distribution uh, among various stakeholders and so on so i think uh, that's where i'll i'll leave this uh, this part there is uh, there is lack of clarity in terms of the relationship between these emerging issues and how national security is perceived in pakistan and who will you know if they are indeed important enough to be looked at uh, through a, a national security lens then how will will, will the, that narrowly defined security lens will define these issues or whether these issues will lead to a change in terms of how national security is perceived in the country so it can you know uh, these are two things and on the state society dimension as well someone rightly mentioned the disconnect between those who get disproportionately affected by the issue, by by the problems like um, climate change and 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 health pandemics and so on and those who who drive policy so generally we have seen that these issues for example climate uh, climate change related issues have manifested themselves at the community levels in the form of question on water availability or sanitation issues and 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 a host of other issues related to urban violence and their pathways have really been through the local electoral politics that that sort of you know deals with or has to deal with these issues at the community level and so on but we see that at a greater uh, policy levels these are not always recognized as as a fallout of climate change some of our research clearly shows this disconnect and where climate change is more sort of perceived with like big disaster uh, sort of sort of uh, uh, sort of um, um, uh, idea so where, where we have flash floods or you know melting of glaciers or these kind of issues have been looked at by policy makers as climate change issues yes uh but then there is a distance and you know they they feel that there are many other things to be taken care of so it they they've been at the back at the back burner more of the constituency level issues have not necessarily been so far perceived as the climate change induced issues 
except perhaps you know you find a little bit in south punjab or in balochistan where you know some connections have been made but largely there is a lack of understanding or framing of more politically relevant issues uh, at the constituency level as uh, as climate change issues so that greater political impetus is there for the political class to do something about it and to frame it as such and then you know so we can see more impetus at the policy level so i think that is where that uh, society state society disconnect uh, also manifests uh, itself and i think that's why and i'll conclude with with this thought that this is where platforms like these are very very important where we can talk about these various disconnects within and between various social uh, groups and between the state and the society itself create knowledge that can create pathways for better understanding of these issues and their fallout and their political implications or their national security implications so that the policy makers can can relate to it can uh, take it up in a in a more serious manner and do something about it so i think this is where i'll i'll leave this initial sort of provocation so to speak and and then we can we can come back to